Matt Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm here with Dick Gotti of Promax Industries. I'm going to talk today about emerging technologies that will drive a lot of the heterogeneous integration going forward. Dick, when we think about heterogeneous integration, this is driving a lot of the future development going into semiconductors. But there's a lot of things that are being integrated there that are not just silicon chips, right? For sure, yes. The whole concept of heterogeneous integration implies combining with classic electronics non-electronic components. They allow you to add functionality that you can't get with pure semiconductors. You know, semiconductors, frankly, are kind of dull. They kind of just sit there on the table and they consume power and they get warm, but that's about all they do. If you want to have noises or detect motion or see what's going on, you've got to add something else like an image sensor or a, I don't know, a coil that moves a, moves a piston or something of that sort. Let's take a closer look. Sure. Typically, we start, all, we start out with a, a silicon wafer, typically 12-inch um, diameter here. And, you know, this thing has got a series of chips in it that we will eventually singulate here and, and individual devices. And in, with heterogeneous integration, what we, what we often have is, is a substrate uh, that I might just draw uh, like this here, uh, and it's always got a thickness to it with what that implies about how you handle it. And we mount ch chips on these things here that we, we cut out of these devices here. Now, the issue with silicon chips and electronics in general is it doesn't really interact with the environment very much. You put power into it, it consumes power, it gets hot, but it just sits there. And in sensors, and in, which is one of the main applications, if not the main applications, of heterogeneous integration, you need to have some other kind of device that interacts with the environment. You need a photo detector to detect light, uh, a motion detector to make, you get mo movement. You can have chemistries on to detect particular kinds of molecules. And then you want to get information off of the device. Sometimes you've got RF devices that you have to that, that communicate through Wi-Fi. You can put uh, use sound uh, and make a beep or even send a, a ultrasonic sound that is detected by some other device somewhere else uh, here. And, and all of these parts have to be built and, and interconnected typically on a substrate here. And that's what's called heterogeneous integration here. here. Uh, and one of the things that's going on these days is, is that there's, while we're talking here about silicon wafers in the mainstream, heterogeneous integration tends to be the area of technology and application where the newest kinds of devices are and components are introduced. Like today, for example, there's a lot of talk about using glass as a substrate, particularly for medical devices. Well, Why glass? Well, glass has a, a series of interesting characteristics. First, you can get a, a very broad range of thermal coefficients of expansion. Typically, silicon's around three. Most of the organics are up around 10 to 30 in that range. So you tend to stay away from them for things that undergo a lot of temperature changes because temperature changes cause warpage and what have you. The other characteristic glass has is that it, uh, is, it is very inert. Uh, and you can pick the chemistries of glass. There's lots of options. You can make sure it doesn't have bad stuff in it, for example. And, and most glass doesn't, but there's a lot of the things that are conventionally used in metals and what have you often have uh, an element in them that are de detrimental to biological and medical device. And with glass, typically you can make that very flat, right? So one of the problems with a lot of the substrate materials is they really have to be planed down incredibly flat. Yeah, yes, and, and glass lends itself to be unusually flat. I mean, there's the classic optical flat that's been used with their, their flat to fractions of a micron here, and that's still widely used, and, and so that's, it, it provides a good starting point, a good platform, and then you can build on it. You can build dielectrics on it, you can deposit metal, you can pattern them like you do semiconductor wafers or more properly uh, printed circuit boards. Uh, and they typically, you, if you're going to put down metals, you typically would try to build the, uh, the glass uh, substrate on both sides that in a way that's not quite symmetrical or mirror image, but so that you balance the stresses that occur from the difference in coefficient of expansion 
of the metal interconnect from that of the glass. Typically the metals are around, copper's around 15 ppm. So you get a lot of strength, stress in it if you start getting big temperature variations. So now that you've got that flat substrate in there, where do you go next? What comes next that you're starting to see that you haven't seen in the past? The, the glass substrate gives you, gives you a series of options. You, you can certainly build waveguides into it. You can put, you can use this transparency. You can put through silicon vias in it, uh, so that you can send signals and power from one side to another. Uh, particularly a, a simple electronic f through silicon vias, and that, that's a big issue here. One of the things that people are talking about doing is on one side of it, of a substrate. For example, you distribute the power here, and you, and, and if the, if this substrate was relatively big, like I'll call it um, uh, a 50 millimeters, for, for example, substrate here, like that here. And you might have a whole series of, of, of through glass vias in it, for example. Um, and what, what happens when you do that is and you, 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 you have one side of it that, that would have the power planes, the other one have, have signal planes on it. Uh, that's where you get. You have to really design it carefully so that you get a balance in in the forces that cause the thing to bend and warp. Then once you get all the interconnect structures built on this thing here, now you're ready to start adding components like the things I've already drawn on here. These are just chips that are mounted someplace, but you might have other things. You might have little coils of some sort in here, for example, because one of the issues that you run into in a lot of medical and biotech devices is how do you get the power into the, into the end device? Uh, a common thing to do is to inductively couple, for example. You can also just simply put a, uh, a, a solar cell on it, if you will, and shine bright light on it and use the light and to use that to, as a source of electric power. Because many devices today operate at such low current, you get plenty of power to run a lot of simple things. Not only do you, can you run the electronics on here to gather information, but you can utilize the same kind of technologies to broadcast with RF, for example, or you can send the information off as, as an infrared signal, which is another common thing that's done. And in the past, we were pretty much working off of very digitized uh, bits. Does this now change? Do we now now start moving into uh, perhaps some sort of analog communication that we didn't oh, have in the past? Oh, very much so. Uh, the, the, the digital is, you know, in the real world, the people and animals and critters are kind of an artificial uh, methodology. Uh, the real world is all analog and over many, many orders of magnitude of intensity and variation. I mean, light's the most obvious. I mean, you can easily find six orders of magnitude intensity of light just by looking around a room here. And you know, that's as opposed to the just yes, no kind of things of digital, yes. Uh, and that's one of the main advantages, characteristics that you get from heterogeneous integration is the introduction of, of a lot of analog devices and analog methodologies for signaling and gathering information and detecting. And those haven't always meshed very well with some of the digital stuff simply because of things like noise. Do you now get better buffering if you work on one side of the, the substrate there and then the other with glass? And not especially. I, I, I think glass is no better or worse than uh, conventional circuit boards or silicon for that issue. I, the issue of interference, signal and noise ratio and what have you it remains it's a matter of proximity, location, configuration, geometries, and basically isolation and good and high signal and noise ratio depends upon very good and careful design. How about bonding? Ah, bonding, yes. Um, glass brings a whole new dimension to that. That's one of the I issues with glass. Uh, is we know how to bond things to silicon, we know how to bond things to epoxies, but how do we do with glass? And the answer is uh, we don't really know. There have not been a lot of work done that I'm aware of is that shows that if you go ask people, for example, what's the field strength of something on glass? Uh, you get a blank stare. They're not used to running that kind of things. We're, we're at that stage with glass where we understand its benefits, we understand what it brings to it, but we don't really understand very well the real details of it. You know, uh, if, if you go ask a circuit board to, guy how many uh, PSI, pounds per square inch, you get of, of peel strength, or pounds per linear inch you get of peel strength of uh, uh, copper on epoxy, they'll know. Uh, I think it's on the order of 10 to, 10 to 20. 
pounds per inch here. But if you ask about that for, on glass, you don't get an answer. People don't know. You've been working a lot with bi the biotech uh, world, right? Yes. What's changed there? What changed about 10 years ago uh, is people decided that they wanted to utilize electronics to sequence DNA here. And there's a whole bunch of schemes that have been developed to do that that I'm no expert in, and I've seen a few of them. But what many of them require is the deposition on silicon of some kind of a chemistry. And that when a, a sample that contains some DNA is, is put on it, uh, it's detected by some mechanism, uh, a change in color, an emission of photons of some particular wavelength, uh, conductivity changes. Uh, there's a variety of schemes that are used. Uh, and I talk about DNA, but it's really proteins uh, and other kinds of organic things. It's all kinds of varieties from very small molecules to the really big macromolecules that the technologies are being developed, have been developed and being used uh, here for a variety of purposes here uh, it, by the biotech industry. And that brings in a whole different element of we need to secure these signals too, right? Most of the technologies, it's not difficult to secure most of these technologies at the source. Realistically, they don't broadcast you know, on Wi-Fi or anything. They're very local. In fact, the opposite is the problem. Some of them, the signal strengths are so low that it's hard to find. And uh, I don't think people worry so much at the analytic level about security here. I think it's once you've got the data in a stored format, now you bring in all of the electronic issues associated with data that's stored and potentially available through the internet as many things are these days. Is there enough volume there to sustain this as you move forward? So you're talking about a, a, a wafer that's probably what, uh, 300 millimeter that you're working off of? Yes. Is there enough volume to, to be able to put all these things together or do you now need to start mixing these up into different types of uh, chips inside? Uh, no, there are a lot of devices. I mean, you, you typically get on the order of a thousand devices off of one 12 inch wafer. And there are many things that are used in terms of a half a million or a million a year. And you know, that's a thousand wafers, a thousand wafers, you know, a couple thousand bucks a piece, pretty soon you're talking real money. One of the things we keep hearing about is optical communication. Yeah. Where does that fit in here? That, people have been talking about that as a low power communication source for a while. Y yes, and, it, and it's very, very true and very effective. And optics as a method of transmitting data from point to point is very, very effective. Uh, not only do, do, do you not lose any light when you transmit it through an optical fiber, but a very large amount of data can be shoved through a, a single optical fiber. You know, the, the inherent uh, frequency of light is 200 terahertz. And you know, and you can get sort of three or four bits per cycle without a lot of trouble. There's PAM4 is a very common modulation scheme that's used. And you're, and you're going to see people talking about hundreds of terabits per single optical fiber. And remember the single optical fiber is on the order of 125 microns in diameter. And you can transmit light kilometers here with, with a few watts through. But how do you get that data on and off the chip? Well, you need modulators. You need a lot of fancy optical components that, that are built. These days, uh, photonic integrated circuits is the emerging technology that d describes how this is done. And uh, the preferred methods utilize silicon nitride substrate. Uh, they put indium phosphide, maybe gallium arsenide down as individual chips, like we're describing here. You might have a waveguide that runs through here, and you put a piece of indium phosphide down on it. Uh, there's, some, uh, there's a paper written by, I think it's Bowers, Hochberg, Levinson here that describes pretty nicely what the future uh, looks like is, is likely to be for photonic integrated circuits, which is where the data is gathered and detected here when you transmit very large amounts of data through uh, the, the, an individual fiber. The challenge in the past has been integrating 3.5 materials onto silicon. And uh, yes, that's correct. And, and that continues to be a challenge. Uh, people are finding ways to put it down on wafers. Uh, that's one of the first applications of what's called heterogeneous integration, when you're building non-CMOS structures uh, utilizing non-silicon, uh, conventional silicon processes on wafers. There's a lot of that being done today.
What does that do in terms of your power budget, too? That's a significantly lower amount of power, right? Uh, yes, d definitely. Utilizing optics uh, rather than I squared R losses through copper uh, and conductors is a big so power saving. And uh, that's one of the main drivers uh, of it uh, for optics is the reduction. It's re it fundamentally for, for I.O., it's the main reason for people moving to optics. And you hear people talking about um, co-packaged optics, which mean they want to put the a source and detectors, uh, optical source and the de converters from light to electrons right on the CMOS chip. So that you, you have literally uh, less than a millimeter of distance to carry the signals through copper. And you immediately get it into the optical domain and you leave it there as long as possible. So when you package all these things together, what sort of issues do you run into? Well, the, the, there's the compatibility issue. Uh, will, uh, will things go together? Uh, well, many of them are driven by co coefficient of thermal expansion. Another issue is, is that many of these things are getting physically small, especially in the optical space, where you're often under a, a micron in, in accuracy required of locating things. So that's a challenge as to how do you accomplish that and build things with that level of accuracy in here. There's another issue is thermal control. Uh, when you start talking about the data rates that we're talking, a one degree temperature change in something will move you a lot of wavelengths uh, or a, a large uh, frequency band at, at these optical frequencies uh, here. And so you have to deal with that and you're seeing devices now where you have to control the temperatures of the light sources very tightly here within a within a with certainly within a center uh, one degree centigrade all that we've seen I've seen some devices that are where the temperature control re required is a hundredth of a degree power has been a big issue a lot of people are talking about it where do you see it actually playing out in the marketplace well today the the, the, the demand is very high to reduce power uh, all of the communications that you see to support AI, the net, in, the internet, and what have you, uh, all of that data that's being sent around can be more efficiently sent as light as opposed to electrical signals on copper or other conductors. And, uh, and all the big companies that are, have got lots of money, like Google, Meta, NVIDIA, Apple, they're all working hard to move into the optical domain. So I think you're going to see over the next few years a really increased use of optical technologies to simply save power. And much higher resolution as we go forward too, right? Well, for resolution, for imaging, for sure, uh, it, it really implies higher data rates that are associated with that because now you can get very high data rates. There are people talking about transmitting terabytes uh, per second of data through these optical fibers and utilizing optical technologies. Not always on fiber, you can do it as a beam in many places too. But that resolution is not just in, in the images, it's also in the data that you're transmitting, right? Oh, well, yes. Yeah. So when you get into these terabit data rates, it typically the data rate at an individual lane, as it's called, is down in the 100 uh, gigabits per second kind of range. And that's still, that's pretty fine. Uh, pretty fine resolution, and, and that's just a sink, simple stream coming across. Dick Audi, thanks for a great explanation. Okay.